So before we hear the scripture this morning, I want to do something a little different. Because this is a, a really familiar story, or at least we think it's so familiar, I'm going to ask you to tell me the story before we actually read it. So don't look in your bulletins yet. Um, so as a reminder, there's two creation stories in Genesis. The first one is the one with the seven days. God created light and darkness, water, earth. We know that. This is the other one. So what do we know about this story? Go ahead and just, just shout out and I'll repeat what, you, what do you say. What are the parts of this story? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Serpent. Serpent. Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden. Apple. 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 Tree. Tree. Snake. 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 Forbidden fruit, free will, free will. Knowledge, of knowledge of good and evil. Anyone in an orange shirt, what do you remember about this story? Anything that hasn't been said? About forgiveness, interesting, thank you. Anything else we left out? Eve is the bad one. Eve is the bad one. Yeah, what, what else, what else, yeah? What does Adam mean? Shame. So, blame game. The creation stories of, of Genesis 2 and 3 are so ingrained in our culture, we think we know what's there because it's in our children's stories and, and our culture to such an extent that um, that we kind of know the story, even, even in a time when many of us might feel like we don't know the Bible all that well, we, we know this one. And yet, I'm going to say that this morning as we take a closer look, when we read it without the glasses of tradition and interpretation, this story has a lot more to offer and might have something very different to offer than what it has been used to teach uh, for, for centuries. And I want to zero in on a few verses just to sort of highlight this. We won't, we won't go through the whole thing. But, but in verse 7, so this is um, the, the first being being created. And Gerald asks, what does Adam mean? What does Adam mean? And so it's actually exactly where I wanted to go. Because in Hebrew, this sentence is a, a play on words. It's basically the, the equivalent would be that the Lord God formed a human from the humus. Humus is like soil an earthling from the earth. The point isn't man, masculine. The point is that this creature comes out of creation, that that's the, the language that the writers are using, the point of uh, that language that they're using. And the alliterative play on words makes clear that the emphasis is not on the man being created first. And we don't have to go into the, does it mean anything that they were created first? Does that mean they're a superior? That's a whole other layer of interpretation but that the relationship between humans and the earth, that we are one, that we are creatures of it, created by and for it. The second place I want to look again is the creation of the second human. So Jeannie's point of the woman was created second, and, and that has been used all these years to say, well, women are inferior. But in verse 18, God says, it is not good that the human should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. And in verse 20, it's clear that none of the other creatures, the animals that have been created already, fulfill this need for companionship. And so God creates a true equal for the first human. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, it is declared. Perhaps it's not subordination, but actually equality that's the point there. God desires companionship for the first human. Mutuality for the two humans, that partner is the emphasis, not helper. Helper as my partner. In the, Bible, in the Bible, a lot of times that second verb is the emphasis. It's sort of the repetition that makes the point. Helper is my partner, that these are equals. They are made out of the same substance. God says, it is not good that the earthling should be alone. We are made for companionship. We are made for one another. So these are just, just two small points of this story, and, and we could go through and do more. But re-encountering the creation story, re-reading it for what is there, rather than what we have been taught about it, liberates us from the constraints of human interpretation and reconnects us with the ever-unfolding lessons from this ancient tale. 
We could get later, and, and I would love to do a Bible study about this, about the whole scene with the serpent and the fruit. It's not actually an apple. That blew my mind when I learned that in seminary. There's no apple in this story. Original sin is not mentioned anywhere. Someone came up with that later. So it's amazing how this same story can point either to patriarchy or egalitarianism, either responsibility and care of creation or punishment, care of creation or dominion, determinism or freedom. And this is one of our foundational stories as Christians, one of the tales that even those of us who feel relatively biblically illiterate think we know, or at least we're familiar with it. It's part of our foundational myth. It tells us the story of who we are, who God is, and what our purpose is. And I've been thinking a lot about foundational myths this week. Of course, the 4th of July highlights for us in this country questions around what we celebrate on that day, or maybe what we recognize, or mourn, or lament. Do we celebrate freedom, or lament the oppression that has been existent in this country from the start? Are we the home of the free, or inheritors of a society that was built on white supremacy, slavery, genocide, and patriarchy? Do we venerate or vilify the Founding Fathers? Of course, all of these questions are front and center in our public debates about school curriculums, public policy, even children's books, and Fourth of July parades. And our own denomination has also been wrestling with a similar question around our own foundational narratives. We took a significant step towards rewriting our history this past week at General Synod in Indianapolis. Since 1957, when our denomination was founded, we have told ourselves and taught our students and congregations that there are four streams that came together to found the UCC in 1957. The Congregational, the Christian, the German Evangelical, and German Reformed. Our own congregation was part of that congregational stream. But last year, thanks to the tremendous work and research and advocacy of Yvonne Delk and a group of other historians, the UCC recognized a fifth stream in its formation, that of the Afro-Christian Convention. The Afro-Christian Convention traces its lineage back to the hush harbors of northern coastal North Virginia and Virginia, where enslaved people gathered in secluded settings to worship together and carry on the traditions of their African heritage. By the mid-1800s, formalized congregations emerged. And by the end of the 19th century, the Afro-Christian Convention was a formal denomination with at least 69 churches, biennial gatherings, a publishing house, and formal missions and auxiliary groups. The Afro-Christian Convention stands in contrast to other black church movements that also flowed into the United Church of Christ, most notably the black congregational tradition. But the Afro-Christian tradition did not emerge in response to white Christianity out of the balconies of segregated congregational churches, or out of the education of black churches by institutions supported by the, Afro the American Missionary Association, which was a largely white congregationalist effort towards abolition and reconstruction. And the Afro-Christian Convention is notable also for their continuation of African-style worship, their independence and adherence to the early Christian church values, when I say Christian there, I mean Christian with a capital C, which is called the first American denomination that recognized Christ as the head of the church, so no bishops or other centralized authorities, the value of Christian as a name and identity, no need for other denominational monikers like Presbyterian or Episcopalian or Congregational, and Christian character as a sufficient test of membership, not creeds or personal piety. I realize I'm getting a little far into the weeds of our denomination's history. It's a little dry. But the history of this Afro-Christian convention had been subsumed under the history of the black congregational tradition. And the merger of the Christian and congregational churches prior to the formation of the UCC. So for a long time, they thought there was basically just one stream of black church that fed into the UCC. But the Afro-Christian Convention remained an active conference with its own organization and gatherings for over three decades after the formation of our denomination. Its erasure in our history is a result of implicit racism, 
that flattened the diversity and complexity of black communities and undervalued the importance of the contributions of black Christians to our denomination. This past week at our General Synod, we celebrated the publication of a new book that tells the story of the Afro-Christian Convention. Our outgoing president issued a public apology for the erasure of this history. And we began to correct the historical wrongs that have been done because of the entrenched racism that has kept this story from being taught and celebrated for more than 60 years. While in some ways this is insignificant, what impact will be felt in the world by the fact that our little denomination is making this formal change to our history that's no, not even to all that many people within our, our little denomination. But on the other hand, in the midst of a society that cannot seem to find a way to reckon with the needed uncovering and teaching of fuller history of our country, perhaps it matters a whole lot that our predominantly white denomination is at long last repenting of our ignorance, of our racism, and of our foundational misunderstandings. Modeled in our synod and in the conversations leading up to it has been a spirit of humility, of grace, and a desire to affirm the dignity and gifts of all people. We have shown a willingness not to cling to our old stories just because that's what we were taught when we were young, and an openness to learn from our siblings and hear God's still speaking voice pour out yet more truth. The same clinginess to inerrancy of scripture underpins many white people's clinging to the iner inerrancy of our narratives about the infallible and heroic stories of the founding of this nation. The same idolatry of white supremacy, the same idolatry of supremacy of whiteness and maleness has held up the interpretation of Genesis 2 that is passing legislation that bans the teaching of LGBTQ stories, black history, and American history in our schools. Do we hold scripture sacred or the human interpretation of it that we have been taught? Do we hold the values of equality and freedom sacred or the idea that we had already achieved those things? As we re-examine our foundational myths of our scripture, of our nation, and of our denomination, may we have the humility to look for what is really there, not just what we think is there. May we have the courage to reconcile our formerly held beliefs with the truth of God's activity in history. And may we have the grace to admit when we are wrong. Thanks be to God for a church that is open to hearing God's still speaking voice, to our siblings speaking and their lived experience that show us that there is indeed yet more light and truth to break forth from God's holy word. May it be so.